Good morning. Okay, there it is. My bad. That was my bad. I didn't turn on the mic. But we're so glad you are here with us this morning. And so whether you're watching online or whether you're in person, we just want to welcome you and make sure that you know that we're glad you're here. So if you are new, go ahead and text the number that's going to be on the screen in a second. And we just want to send you a gift. So if you are new, text that number Uh, text the word new to the number on the screen and we're just going to send you a gift and make sure that you are welcome here. And so I have a couple announcements before we start worship this morning. The first one being that we have a youth retreat this Friday and Saturday. It's going to be a ton of fun. If you want to find out more information about that, whether you're a parent who has students going on that retreat or your parent that wants to know more about that retreat. We have a parent meeting in the youth room right after service today, so make sure you go to that. Second, worship circle this Friday uh, from seven to nine at the well. And so that'll be a time of worship and fellowship and just hearing some good tunes. And so we have a men's prayer breakfast this Saturday at 8 a.m. in the dining room. So don't miss out on that. And lastly, Easter breakfast. We're gonna have an Easter breakfast, I mean on Easter, at 8 a.m. in the gym, and so um, you need to register for that, and that'll be a great opportunity to fellowship and just come together and get our minds right um, on Easter Sunday. So Easter breakfast, 8 a.m. in the gym. So those are some announcements we have for you. Um, You can always find more announcements on our handouts that we have um, from our sermon notes and online through email, through social media. There's plenty of other ways to look at this as well as the website and other things like this, but we just wanted to highlight some of our announcements for you this morning. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump right into worship. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for being who you are. Lord, I pray that we focus on you this morning. I pray that we realize how good you are, and that you are God. Lord, I pray that we throw down our distractions, and that we can just wholeheartedly worship you, because you are good and you are God. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for, our son, for your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's all stand together and have this time of worship, singing about the solid rock that we have in Jesus.
scripture today is Hebrews 10 19 through 22 and so dear brothers and sisters we can boldly enter heaven's most highly place because of the blood of Jesus by his death Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Trophies 
The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world.
Wow, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. Well, it's good to see each one of you here this morning. If you're a guest with us, my name is Pastor Andy. We want to welcome you. If you are a guest, we would ask that you would take your phone out and text the word new to the number on the screen. And the reason we'd ask you to do that is we have a gift that we would like to send to you. We're not going to blow your phone up and we're not going to show up at your house or embarrass you or anything like that in any way at all. We just want a way to connect with you so that we can show our appreciation for you joining with us this morning. So if you're a guest, whether you're in the building or if you're watching online, either one, if you would just text us to let us know that we would be able to send that gift card to you as a way of saying thank you. Well, I want to pray and then we're going to jump into our service this morning. Father, we pray that you would open our hearts as we open your word, that you would help us to see what you have for us and that you would show us exactly the, the, the point that you want us to take away from this morning, applying to our lives so that we can draw closer to you. Lord, we know that every time we come together, there's something that you want us to see and something you want us to learn. So we ask that you would show us that this morning, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I don't know if you guys are very tech-savvy or nerdy, kind of like I am or anything like that, but there is a scientific journal and I am not smart enough to read most of these, just to throw that out there as a preface, but uh, I read about this week that talked about something special that happened last April, and scientists saw the very first cosmic blast within our own Milky Way galaxy that's ever happened. Anybody hear about that or read about it? You missed it too? Okay, I don't feel so bad then. I thought this was something real special, but uh, they're called fast radio bursts, or F. RBs, and this is a picture of one of them, and it's here in our galaxy, and these, these burst in and, and just explode in light, and then just within milliseconds, they're, they're gone, and they say that they are powered, and this, the brightness and the, the power that's inside of here is, get this, it's like 500 million of our suns combined together. I mean, that's pretty powerful, and they show up, and then they leave, and this particular uh, fast radio burst was only... 32,616 light years away. That's pretty close, right? I mean, it's just like running down to Walmart. For us, that doesn't seem very close, but when you consider that the next closest one we ever have on record is 490 million light years away in a complete other galaxy. So it's kind of neat to see some of these things, and I love to watch the stars, and I have a book called The Gospel in the Stars, and it talks about how we can see God's plan of salvation even amongst the constellations that are out there, and I, I like to look at them, I like to see them. I have a friend who takes pictures of the stars up in Alaska where he lives, he's a pastor as well, and I love to see the, the beauty that God created, to know that the God who created that is interested in me and loves me and cares about me. And the interesting thing about these fast radio bursts is scientists have not been able yet to figure out where they come from. But I think if we were to discuss it amongst ourselves, I think we probably all would come to the same agreeance of where they come from, wouldn't you? I, I don't think it's by chance. I don't think it's by accident. I think God allows these things, and God created these things for us to see. In an article in Wired Magazine, I'm going to quote it for you because this is another magazine that I personally don't read, but I found this week. It says, scientists believe that fast radio bursts could ultimately help us learn what's in between galaxies after all, and that they could give us a more complete picture of our universe. That's interesting. But, you know, with talking about these and how they just explode in with such power and such brightness and such beauty... I can't help but see a parallel with what happened in our earth over 2,000 years ago when Jesus burst onto the scene. It begs us to ask this question. Do you experience Jesus like that in your life? Or is he just something different? Is he something that's not quite as important? Do you experience Jesus with all the wonder and the fascination of something that is amazing like that? Or, is he something different for you? Is he just so typical and so ordinary and so predictable to you that your Jesus looks more like the flannel graph version of Jesus? If you grew up in Sunday school, you've seen these. Flannel graphs, you remember those? 
yeah, I remember Sunday school and, and watching the flannel graphs, and that's how I pictured the Bible as a little boy growing up in Sunday school, is this is what Jesus looked like. This is what the world looked like. This is what happened. This is all of the, but that's not real. Of course, Jesus isn't just a fast radio burst either. He's not like that. He's God incarnate, fully man, and fully God in the flesh. We're in our third week going through the Gospel of Mark and looking at the stories that God has given to us in here. And I, hopefully you've, you've been listening with the app and, and going through the reading with us and you've gotten connected with one of the, the watch groups. And if you haven't gotten connected one, with one, you can still do that or still start one. We're sending the emails out on Sunday afternoon uh, so that you can get the links for that week to be able to watch this. And it's really an amazing thing to be able to watch and see what it could have looked like when Jesus was uh, here on this earth. And he shows up, Jesus shows up though, when you start listening and start watching this, he shows up with this amazing uh, power. It, it's like one of those fast radio bursts. It's just, it's, it's amazing. It's power. He just burst on the scene. And nobody knows exactly what to do with him or what to make of him. And you're going to see that when you start watching in, uh, in Mark chapter 1. And Jesus' very first words in Mark 1 are this. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's, that's pretty powerful for Jesus' first words recorded to us here in the book of Mark. The time is fulfilled. That word time is the Greek word kairos, and it means a new era, a new season, a new measure of time is upon us. We're in a new era. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom, that word kingdom there means a ruler, realm, or reign. It's taking this, the, a whole new kingdom has shown up. This kingdom is marked by the reign of the Messiah. So the time, the old era is complete. There's a new era and a new kingdom on us with a new ruler, and it is at hand. And that word at hand means to approach near. It's the kingdom of God is near us. It's close. The old time is past. The new is here. The new kingdom is about to be set up with Christ ruling on it, and it's close. The 400 years that we saw between Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament are over. The God who felt like he was so far away is now an ever so near close God who shows up on the scene in person. And last week we talked about how that hope is no longer deferred, that it's here. And then like this cosmic burst, this, this brighter than 500 million suns shows up and his name is Jesus. As you watch the videos for this week, going through the book of Mark, and you're just watching in the background, and they're reading the book of Mark to you, so you're really, literally hearing the words of Christ. You're hearing the, the words of the Gospels. As you watch it this week, you're going to see that Jesus bursts with presence as he goes and meets two fishermen and says, uh, and, and says to them, follow me, and, he says, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. I mean, they just walked away from everything to follow Jesus. And then two others leave their dad in their boat to do the same. Then we see Jesus bursting with authority as he teaches in the synagogues. And, and the, here's it in Mark 1.22. It says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. I mean, Jesus just shows up with this authority that's unexplainable. Then we see his power. He's just bursting with power as he casts out a demon. And he heals a loved one who, and, and, and he wouldn't even stop healing till the sun went down. In Mark 1.33, it says the whole city was gathered together at the door. Everybody came out to see Jesus doing these miraculous healings. And then, even though he's in front of an entire crowds and great multitudes, there's still this intimacy that we see in Jesus. And he kind of slips out and gets away from the crowd and goes out on his own so that he can spend time alone with the Father. And we see in Mark 1, 37 that his disciples and they said this, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. They kind of got a little aggravated that Jesus had to slip off by himself. I mean, come on, get in here. Everybody's looking for us. We've we got to start our kingdom now. But he still needed that time alone with God. We see him with compassion as we go through our stories this week as he touches a leper and heals him. And he tells him to go show yourself clean to the priest. But then Jesus says, but keep this between us. <laughs> and what happened? As the guy leaves, he's been cleaned and he starts yelling, clean, clean, I'm clean. I mean, can you imagine his whole life being separated out as a leper, being uh, unclean, not able to come around people, not able to spend time with his family, and now he's healed. 
And Jesus goes away from everybody after this happens to kind of avoid the unwelcome attention from the authorities. And Mark 1.45 says Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but, out of desolate, but, was, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. Jesus was trying to get away, but people with needs kept coming to Jesus. Then we see an amazing story in our reading this week and in our watching this week where Jesus bursts through a roof. I mean, four guys trying to get their friend to Jesus who needs a healing. And they break open a roof and drop their friend down in, and Jesus not only heals his legs, but he heals his heart. Mark 2, 12, the man gets up, peels his mat off his legs and says this, he, he, and the verse says this, he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. That's the way Jesus was. We see him kind of bursting through all the protocol of things that happen in the world and all that was going on as he ate with misfits and outcasts, people who were sinners. And Jesus took a lot of flack over being around people who weren't the religious elite or the religious crowd. Jesus ate with these sinners, these people who were far from God, people that were considered outcasts. In Mark 2, if you read through 15 down to 17, I'm just going to read the last part of verse 17. It says, Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus told them. Of course I'm going to be out with the sinners. I'm going to be out with people who are sick, who need me. Then we see Jesus who in, in our story as we go through our watch groups this week as he bursts with anger and he, he kind of stares down the religious elite and upset by their stubborn hearts and says to a man with a deformed hand, stretch out your hand. And what does Jesus do to him? This man who has this shriveled hand who has been a mess for his, all, his whole life all of a sudden because Jesus has him reach his hand out in faith, something miraculous happened and his hand becomes fully formed again and it's flexible it's functioning. It works. He's got use of it again, just like it was designed to work initially. But Jesus did all that on the Sabbath, which was a big no-no, and that's why he took heat from the religious leaders, and they got so upset. And groups that were on opposite ends, that were normal enemies, come together in, in unity to fight against Jesus. Mark 3, 6 says, The Pharisees went out immediately and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him, these, these opposite enemies. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, as we would think of today, is what's happening here. And they were partnering up against Jesus. And then even in the midst of all this, while Jesus is healing people and miracles are going on, and, and he's got opposition that he's facing from the religious crowd, the people who are far from God, the people who were sinners, they couldn't get close enough to Jesus. They would burst through to Jesus to get as close to him as they could so that they did anything and everything they could to see him and to touch him and to be near him. Mark 3.10 says, For he healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around to touch him. Man, when I read that again this week, I thought, you know, the, the religious crowd couldn't get far enough away from Jesus. The sinners couldn't get close enough to Jesus. How do I treat Jesus? Is he just something for the weekend? Or would I do anything to be near him and to touch him and to be close to him? In fact, even the demons came around Jesus and burst through in many different ways to plead for mercy, but Jesus rebuked them and, and cast them out. And I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to capture that on flannel graph. <laughs> it would be difficult, but we're living in a time where we need God to burst through in our lives too. I need, let me, let me make that more specific. I don't, because I don't know where you're at, but I know in my life, I need him to burst through in my life. I need him today. I need him every day. The world we live in with this virus and the craziness as people feeling helpless, small, vulnerable, uncertain, distrusting, cynical, and fearful. And it really has kind of showed us how little control we have over our lives and over our world anyways. There's pain in our communities. There's protests in our streets. We're faced with prejudice and biases that we have that we're constantly being exposed to. And when we see it, we kind of run to our safe corner to be by ourselves, and then we just complain about how bad the world is. When what we need is Jesus to break through in our life. Our economy's a mess. There's people without jobs all over our communities. 
And we just kind of limp along a fraction of what we used to be, even inside our own lives and our own hearts. We're struggling. We see the worst, we just, I mean, we just experienced the worst, most divisive presidential election probably in U.S. history. I don't know. It's the worst one I've ever seen. And people are still wondering when we're going to come back together as a country with all this division. And it even spreads into churches. I've been reading some this week about mental illness, and mental illness in our world is at an all-time high. Anxiety, depression, suicide spiking at unprecedented numbers. People feel isolated today. We feel like we're all alone. We're disconnected. We feel like we have no control over what's happening in our world. Our whole world has been turned completely upside down. So little things become big things, and, and we bottle everything up until we explode finally. But that's the kind of world that Jesus showed up in. And I don't know about you, but I need Jesus to show up for me today. We need Him to burst into our hearts and into our homes into our world, into our churches like he's never done before. And that's why what we're talking about today is so important, how Jesus bursts onto the scene. He just shows up with power and might, unlike anything that's ever happened. As we go through, I want to point out just a couple of things. If you've got your fill in the blanks there, you can go along, follow along with that. Or if you're following along on the app, the first thing I want you to write down is this. Jesus is still able to burst into our world today. And can I tell you, we need him to. We need Jesus to kind of show up, not just to slip in the back door and be a little bit quiet and let's just slowly accept, oh, well, yeah, Jesus just came in the room. He's sitting in the back there. We need him big time in our worlds. And I'm not just talking about the rest of our world. I'm talking about an our world, my world, your world. We need him to show up. If you think about it, if you stop and try to wrap your head around this, I mean, we believe that Jesus was 100% human and 100% God. He was God and he was man. A member of the Trinity. And that's a hard thing to explain. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we don't completely understand it here. We probably never will while we're here on this earth. But Jesus, as one of the Trinity, and the Bible says that out of him... Everything was created out of nothing. In the Latin, it's called the ex nihilo. It, it, out of him, nothing became everything. And, and that means that God, the originator, the source of all energy, power, everything, is available to us. He is a part of that trinity. The God of all creativity, of all power, became human flesh and walked around amongst us. What would it be like if he did that today? What would it be like if that God showed up at your front door this afternoon and knocked? Or text you? <laughs> How would you respond? Would you welcome him in? Would you say, oh, come on, we, we got a place right here. You know, let, 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 let me ask you, let, let's spend some time together. Let's talk, let's... Or would it be, oh, can you hang on just a second and close the door so we can clean our house up? And I don't mean from dirt. I mean from all of the stuff that we don't think Jesus would want to see in our home. Dusting our Bible off and pulling it out and putting it on the coffee table, pretending like we read it every day. What would it be like if he showed up in your house this afternoon? Would it be uncomfortable for you? Would you feel weird? Would you feel awkward? I can't imagine what it would have been like to actually sit and hear Jesus teach. To see him with my own eyes. To watch him heal. To watch him do those miracles. All that. The God of all creativity and all power it became human to walk around and seeing that. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. You know what's so important about that right now in the world that we live in? It's, it's kind of a big deal. Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The same Jesus, the same one, 
who was there at creation, who spoke, and things came into being. The same God, the same Jesus who, who was there, who formed the earth, who formed Adam in the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life. The same one, over 2,000 years later, shows up and walks on this earth and is crucified by men. The same Jesus is waiting to burst into our lives today. And he knocks. But can I tell you, he's not going to force himself on anybody. The same Jesus. He's available. So let me ask you this question. What area of your world do you need Jesus to break through in today? What's going on in your life where you would say, I need God. I need God in this area. What is it in your life where you need Him? Where if you don't get Him, or if He doesn't show up, you don't know what you'll do. Where do you need Him? That leads us to the second thing I want you to write down, and that's this. Jesus is bursting paradigms today. This is amazing. I love this one. A paradigm is the way we see things, and we see, we're going to see this as we go through our videos this week and as we re, do our reading this week. A paradigm, some, the way that you look at something, it's, it's the grid that I look at the world through. And Jesus comes and shifts our worldview. He shifts our paradigm. Because Jesus just loves to, sh to show up, to burst in, and shift the way we look at things. He loves to come in and change the way we see things, and he wants us to see things, he wants to see people, he wants us to see situations the way that he sees them. So he's got to shift the way we see things so that we'll see it the way he does. Even Jesus' Mary, uh, Jesus' own mother Mary sang at his birth in Luke chapter 1. says this, God has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. We see Jesus do this over and over all again through his adult life. He busts up the prideful. He, especially those in the religious community. He would shift the way people would see things and how they did things. And then he raised up the humble and the broken. Jesus had a way of just kind of flipping things upside down, flipping things on their head. I mean, the temple and the, and this, this day and when he was alive was not the place where you would go to see God. It's not the place that anybody could just get into to have an experience like a church that is open today. Who's in was out. Who's out was in. And it's always been that, that certain people didn't have access, but now we can come right in and worship God wherever we are because we have access to Him. I don't have to go through another man. I don't have to go get my sins forgiven from another person. I can directly access God and talk to Him. The God who created everything hears my prayers, listens to me. Jesus flipped everything. There's no more dividing lines. There's no more tiers or caste system or anything like that. Anybody can come to the table now. He makes the people who are powerful look impotent and treats the powerless like a prince. Jesus turned everything. And the question that we have to ask ourselves today with Jesus, who showed up in this world over 2,000 years ago and can do the same thing today, show up in our lives if we want Him to, we've got to ask ourselves, what areas in my life does God want to burst? What bubbles, what paradigms does He want to shift? What bubbles in my heart does He want to burst? What about my business? What about in our church? What about in our neighborhoods? In our small groups, what, what areas does God want us to look differently at things? What paradigms are you holding on to that God wants to topple? We see this today a lot in prejudice and in racism. There's no place for that in a Christian. And God wants to shift that in our world. He wants to shift that in our hearts. What paradigm are you holding on to that God wants to shift? What area is He trying to get you to see something differently, but we're resisting? Can I tell you, when we resist that and when we won't submit to Him, it keeps us from what He can do, which is the third thing. In Jesus, we can burst with joy today. 
You see, when I've got those paradigms that I'm holding on to that are not the right thing, I don't have the joy of God in my life. I don't have the joy of the Lord in my life. That only comes through submission to Him and living in accordance to His will. Everywhere Jesus went, people were thrilled to see Him. They were amazed. They were overwhelmed. They were drawn. They were compelled. They were invited because everything was new. This was amazing. And the the pressure that had been building inside of so many of them for so long, they couldn't hold it in. Hope could no longer wait like we talked about last week. The, The hope deferred was finally there. The hope that they had been waiting for for all these thousands of years has finally showed up in Jesus. When Jesus was challenged by the religious leaders about all the bursting energy that he had and all that he had been doing and how he was shifting people's paradigms, something happened. Jesus begins to compare it to something, as Jesus always did, telling stories. I love to see Jesus teach. Jesus was a master storyteller. And Jesus, when he was confronted with this, compared it to a wedding feast. It's a party. When the bride and groom come together, what do we do? We eat cake, we celebrate. And in this culture, a celebration, a wedding celebration would go on for a week. You don't fast. You don't frown. You feast. (laughs) Then Jesus compared it to sewing a patch in. He said, look, things are bursting at the seams here. Old containers, your old, tired, oppressive religion is creating more holes in the garments than, than repairing it. Sewing a patch. That's what he called it. And then in Mark 22, he says it's like new wine. He says no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. And the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But the new wine is for fresh wineskins. Man, we could spend some time there. Jesus compares his coming to a party. He compares his coming to earth like a new patch. Like a new batch of wine that ferments and expands and it bursts with flavor like the world's never seen before why the disciples were able to say to the man as we saw two weeks ago cheer up get on your feet he's calling you not because they didn't know what was going to happen or there was this curiosity or or because the darkness is going to win or because jesus is mad at you no they said cheer up because the god of the cosmos the god who created all of this is here and he's overcome the world and we have access to him because you're called to be the light of the world we get up, we, are, we can be cheered, we can be encouraged, we can have that joy because He wants to be with us and He wants us to see Him face to face to spend time with Him. I have two pictures. I want you to see this first one. That's my uncle. He was the former president, founder and president of the Hells Angels in St. Louis, Missouri. He had 65 men who rode underneath him. My uncle was a bad man. Sorry, I just got. But God moved into my uncle's life and changed him. My uncle Jim, who was the toughest, the baddest guy you'd ever meet. My aunt Karen, I still hear the stories about her yelling at him when he built his first chopper inside their apartment. And they had gold shag carpet and the oil went everywhere. And he said the first time he fired it up in there, it filled the room with smoke, and he could just see her mouth going, and he didn't want to turn it off because he didn't want to hear what she was saying. (laughs) His mom invited him to church. And he kept telling her no and no and no. And and finally, one day, he was under the influence of narcotics. He, He did a lot of drugs. And one day, he finally agreed to it, and she hung the phone up, and she had tricked him into going to church. And Uncle Jim says he, he kept his word, he was a man of his word, and he showed up and sat down in the back, and the preacher, as he was preaching, he said because of the barbiturates that were in his system, he could see his finger kind of just coming right at him like that. But through the service, God sobered him. And he heard God's message. And my uncle trusted Christ that night. And God took a guy who should have been in jail, who should have died many, many times, and turned him into this. He put the next one up. That's my Uncle Jim. And that's how I remember him. My Uncle Jim pastored outside of Chicago for years and then went into evangelism and preached at all the big churches 
And then towards the later part of his life, he, he wouldn't go back to big churches. He only went to small churches because he wanted to help people. And God used that man to affect my life in a big way. And to reach a lot of people for Jesus that never would have come. God changed his paradigm, his way of looking at things. He thought Christianity was for weak people, small-minded people. And it's just like God to flip it over and make him a preacher. My Uncle Jim died in 2000. I asked my dad to preach his funeral. I didn't think this would mess with me like this today. Um, I just listened to his testimony again this week. I have a digital copy on my computer. He called it from dope to hope. But God changed my life because of him. Because God changed his life. Everything changed when he came to Jesus. All of a sudden, the motorcycle that he rode, he still loved motorcycles all the way through. But it wasn't his God. He didn't worship it. Money didn't mean anything to him. Power didn't mean anything to him. I heard stories, Aunt Karen used to tell us of, he was a wild man preaching. He wore a big ring and he put it through the pulpit while he was preaching one day and couldn't get his hand out. They had to get a jigsaw to cut him out after the service was over. He finished preaching with his fist stuck. He was one that if he didn't hear people saying amen, he'd walk out the door and just have a fit out there just saying amen. He said, I brought it with me. I don't need you to do nothing. He ran down one Sunday while he was still pastoring in, I think it was Elgin, Illinois, and jumped up on top of one of the pews and broke his leg. And he crawled over and sat down and finished preaching from the front row. But before that, can you go back to the other picture for me? That's what he used to be. Uncle Jim didn't talk a whole lot and give a whole lot of details about his life back then. Because he used to always say, I don't want to give the devil praise for anything he's ever done. In private, he would tell some stories. Crucified a man to a tree in the woods and left him to die. He tried to take over from him. Horrible things. But God took that and go to the other one, turned it into that. Burst in. Showed up in a powerful way. That's why we can say, cheer up, get on your feet, he's calling you. And he comes in like that cosmic burst, that brighter than five million suns, and he can bring joy. I never saw my uncle without a smile on his face. And he sang all the time. He loved to sing. Would you go through, would you burst through a roof like those four guys did so that you could get to Jesus? Would you go out of your way to let him show up in your life? Would you open the door because he is knocking? Because he doesn't force himself on anybody. We have to choose. We all have paradigms that need to be shifted. We all have opinions that don't mean anything. But if he can do that, turn my uncle into that, he can do anything. That means whatever you're facing today, he can break through. It means whatever you're experiencing in your life, he can break through. Whatever you're experiencing in your job, in your family, in your relationships, he's bigger than that. As long as there is life, there is hope. But the question is, will you let Jesus burst through in your life today?
That's the question that I want you to think about. That's the question I want to leave you with. Because if he does, now be prepared. If you do allow him to show up and take over your life, things will be different. But I, I've been in church my whole life. Things will be different. When we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, things will be different. So be prepared. Will you allow him to burst into your life today? Let's pray. The altar's open. If you want to pray, you're more than welcome to come forward and pray as we're talking. If not, you stay where you're at and do business with the Lord. It's whatever you would like to do. Father, I love you. I thank you for making a difference in Uncle Jim. And seeing how you used him. Help us to open our hearts to you. To surrender our life to you in a way that we've never done before. To let you have control over it. No more this play in church. No more this play in husband or wife or play in Christian or play in employee. It's time for us to get serious. Because our world is messed up. It doesn't matter who wins the election. That's not going to fix it. We know the only fix is you. You said it in your word. If, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will turn from heaven and heal their sins and heal their land. Forgive their sins. Lord, I believe you're just waiting on us to turn to you and let go. And you're waiting for us to just let you burst in. Because you're the God, the same God, same one who's done it so many times in the past. The only difference is us. Help us to surrender to you and to give our life to you. Allow you to burst in in a way that you've never done before. You may be here this morning and you don't really have that relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you, he loves you and cares about you. The Bible says in Romans 3, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every one of us have sinned. None of us have lived a perfect life. And the Bible says in Romans 6, the wages or the penalty for sin is death. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on and says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God loved us so much that even though we sinned and broke his standard of righteousness, he still loved us so much that he gave us his only son. And Romans 5 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus, by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He loved me so much and he loved you so much that while we were still living a life that was separated from him where we wanted nothing to do with him, he loved us so much that he gave his only son to pay the penalty for our sins, which is death, separation from God in a terrible place called hell. And he loved us so much that he gave his son to pay that price. He paid the penalty for my sins and for yours. And he says in Romans 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've never called on his name and asked for that free gift of salvation, you can do that today. You don't have to come forward or take a microphone or you don't even have to be watching online today. On Sunday, you can be watching at any time during the week and wherever you're at. It doesn't matter where or when. But he's calling to you and knocking on your heart's door this morning and asking you to let him in. And if you've never done that before, I would love for you to make that decision today and so would Christ. If you've never accepted that gift but would like to, I'll even help you with the prayer, with praying and asking God for it, but you've got to mean the words in your heart to God. So if you've never done it before but you'd like to accept that free gift of salvation this morning, right where you're at, whenever you're watching this, and God hears the prayer of our hearts so we don't even have to pray out loud, would you just pray with me right now, wherever you're at, and whenever you're watching this, just pray with me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> And I know I deserve to go to hell because of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross.
paying the penalty for my sins. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. If you just prayed that prayer with me, everyone else's heads bowed and their eyes are closed, but if you just prayed with me, would you just look up at me and make eye contact real quick? It's the most important decision you can ever make in your life. And I want to pray for you this week. So what I'd like for you to do is just take your phone out and text the word pray to the number that's on your screen, whether you're watching here or in the building or if you're watching online. Either way, because I want to pray for you. I would never embarrass you. I won't show up at your house. I'm not going to do anything crazy like that. I just want to pray for you, and I promise you I'll pray for you every day this week. So I'd like for you to do that now, if you would, please. Christian, where do you need God to burst through in your life? Let, let, let me rephrase that. Where does God need to burst through in your life? What ideas or what paradigms or what, what opinions does he need to just burst? I'm going to pray in just a moment. And when I pray, I want you to pray. And whatever those are, would you just turn them over to God and let him, let him change your way of thinking? Let him change the way you see things. Let him burst into your life. Turn your life over to him. Fresh, new, resurrender, re-give up, resubmit to him today. Lord, I love you and thank you so much for your word for these stories that you put in this section of your word. It's, they're amazing. How you just burst on the scene and changed the whole world. Changed everything. Just by showing up. Lord, I pray that you would do that in each one of us. Show up in our life. That we would submit ourselves to your spirit and allow him to have free reign in our life in every area. Not just Sundays, but every day. Not just when we're around church people, but when we're at work or home or, or out at the grocery store, wherever we're at, that we would be the Christian that you've called us to be. That we would allow you to lead us and we'd allow you to guide us. And we would allow your joy to be in us. Because we know that the only way we can have true joy is through you. I pray, Lord, that you be with our country. It is a mess. I pray you be with our president and our elected officials, Lord. Would you lead them and guide them and help them to lead a peaceable life. I pray for many who have been impacted by COVID. There's so many in our, our community who are sick, Lord. I pray that you would touch them. So many who have cancer, Lord. I pray for Ken Fielden and his cancer. That you would touch him, be with him. I thank you so much for the great news on, on Leanne this week. Would you just continue to be with her and the doctors as they feel like they can take care of some of these issues she's been facing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Pray for Beth Sappington and her physical needs. And Miles, as the doctors still don't know what's going on, would you give them wisdom and give him strength? For Miss Linda and her physical needs. and For Roger and Dee, Lord, and the physical needs that they have and the things that they're going through right now, I pray, Lord, that you would be with them and give them strength. For Harry and Wilma and the special things that are going on there in their life. Lord, I pray that you would break through for Harry and that you would give him strength as he helps Wilma and that you'd be with her as she's losing her memory. Pray for Vicki Andrew, Lord, and the special physical needs she has and for Rose Estegoy and the physical needs there, Lord, that you would touch her and give her and Mateo wisdom. Lord, I pray for Owen Sigich and the physical needs that he has and thank you for the good news on Don Wilson, Lord, but I pray you continue to be with him and give him strength and healing. Lord, I pray for Vanessa Swearingen and the physical needs that she has for Jonathan as he has COVID and for Thurman and Evelyn as they've tested positive this week and are struggling. Lord, I know Evelyn's got it pretty bad. Lord, I pray that you would give her healing and strength as only you can. Lord, I pray for Matt Cobb's dad who had just had open heart surgery this week, triple bypass. Lord, would you be with him and give him strength, quick healing, no, no serious complications, just a quick recovery time and back to home. Lord, I pray for Andre's sister Jackie and the new treatment that they're going to be starting this week on her. Would you be with her physical needs and just touch her in a special way? And then, Lord, I pray that you would be with our church, that you would bring unity, that you would allow us to be led by your spirit, and that we would follow you. 
And Lord, in any area that we haven't surrendered ourselves to you, that we would do that this morning and allow you to truly be the Lord of our life. We love you, Father, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. On your way out this morning, don't forget the boxes for that you can use for your tithes and offerings. And if you give online, make sure you take care of that. Also, we are communicating through email with a lot of things and get sending updates out. And if you didn't get one this week, it's probably because we don't have your correct email address. So on your way out at the Welcome Center back there, there are several lists with people who are going to help you with that. If you could stop by, we're going to have that out for the next couple weeks to get those updated so we can get information to you as needed. And then remember some of these special needs and special things, but I was so excited when I came in to talk with Cecil and hear the great news on Leanne. So we're going to keep praying. We love you, and I'm glad you're here, Miss Leanne. Encourage me to see you. But would you stand with me, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you. I love you. Have a great day.